You know, I really feel, and I mean this, fortunate to be here um, among you, mostly because this really excellent positive energy is all over the place at this float conference. And I guess I missed a lot of positive energy in previous float conferences, but I'd really like to honor that whole business of this positive energy by taking you folks on a short or brief trip back in time. And in a way, it's kind of fitting because this year, 2018, is the 40th anniversary of Tom Fine and I beginning to do research in flotation. Hey, Tom, come here for a second. Even dressed for the occasion. <laughs> In 1970, I flew into Los Angeles. That's what it looked like in 1970 with the city in the distance there at the top. And I was on my way to start a postdoctoral stint at UCLA Medical School. And I can tell you that at that time, I was totally not paying attention to anything like human density or stress or things that were related to that kind of thing. And it's so interesting to me that over the years, that's kind of how um, my career got shaped looking at stress and the impacts of human density on other species as well as our own. Excuse me. So how did Tom and I get going on this where we were beginning to work together? Well, I left UCLA and went to Ohio, to the Medical College of Ohio. It was a young school. Uh, I really was impressed by the fact that it offered a, a big open doorway to make your own career. And for the first few years, I was doing some of the work that I had started doing, which is the lab and field studies, uh, working with brain sex differentiation, which I'd done at UCLA, and then wildlife contraception and stress in wildlife, which were things that I have actually continued uh, to this day. And Tom, on the other hand, was doing studies with relaxation, biofeedback, and he was also reading John Lilly books. And so he came to me and said, you ought to read this book. I didn't really know him at that time. And so those were the two books. And The Deep Self was the one that I read most deeply and so we started some cross-discipline discussions about this whole business of relaxation and the possibility of using flotation, which we called isolation tanks at the time, to reduce sensory input. And I was especially interested in the possibility that you could use this as a tool for baselining physiological functions so that you would be able to um, drop everything down and then look at it from that perspective and then add in various factors that would change that. A great research tool. And we also, because of the conversations we were having over that time period, we were getting to know each other, we started talking a lot about consciousness and self-awareness and started floating once we got a tank. But before we could get the tank, um, I had to go and sell it to the chairman of my department. So we were on the third floor of the health science building, very formal looking, you know, uh, medical school looking thing. And this is the guy who was my chairman at the time, Leonard Nelson. 
Now, he's really the reason that we ever got this thing off the ground, because without the chairman's permission to use space on, in, in that department, it wouldn't go. And he said to me, when I asked him, he said, well, you're already doing some weird research, working with wild horses in a medical school. And he said, so, sure, why don't you just do that? But remember, you have to fund it. And I said, okay, we can do that. So we did. And the next step was contact with Glenn and Lee Perry. I love Glenn and Lee. I've known them for all of the time, all of the time that we've done this. I met Glenn and Lee in like 1978, I guess, so 40 years. And they've always been just like they are. <laughs> so our first tank was a Samadhi tank. And part of how we learned to float was through discussions that we'd had with Glenn and Lee. And so they were very helpful in getting us oriented. But the thing is that a medical school is a very conservative environment. And in that really conservative environment, it was coats and ties. It was all about uh, posturing, um, institutional review boards, which we've discussed in the last two days somewhat, image, territoriality, and money. Even back in the 1970s, money. And so when we came up with the money and we got the tank, it was time for us to get started. And initially, while we were putting things together, people didn't say very much. So we're wandering around in a lab. And what was this lab? This laboratory was actually provided to us because a fellow faculty member who was doing bird research with quail was leaving. And that's how we managed to move into that lab space and convert it into a tank facility. And after we had the tank rolling and people were floating once in a while, it became very great interest to the people who were in the building as to what's going on up there. What is that thing? And what are you doing in there? And one day, one of the staff members was peeking into the room, and there was somebody in there. So she went down to the office and said, there's a naked man in the bird room. <laughs> so at that point, um, we were pretty well convinced that we had to keep the door closed. <laughs> we were trying to be open-minded about this, you know, but it didn't work that way. So, we had some fun while we were doing, that's Tom basically taking a break on a thousand pounds of Epsom salts. And The next thing that we had to do was to set up the lab. So all this stuff that you see is the process of setting it up. And this was late in 1978. And we didn't really start doing the, any significant experiments until early 1979. So we needed a shower. And I know that's not very fancy, but that's what it was. And we needed a place to take your clothes off and put them back on. And again, not fancy. And we had to have data collection system for electronics. And th that is really an Apple IIe computer up there. And a deck writer, the keyboard down in the left front, was originally collected to a, connected to a PDP-12 computer. Do you know what a PDP-12 looked like? It was a big tower. And it had reel-to-reel -reel tapes that were this big around. And that's how computers were working back then. So you can see we had a lot of stuff to deal with in order to get this thing rolling. It was, by these standards today, incredibly primitive. That's Tom floating. <laughs> 
That's me taking blood pressure of a subject immediately after the float, and we had them put their arm out of the side of the tank, and we had, so we had cut a hole in the side of the tank, and then we put a plug in there so that while they're floating, there was no light. And then we'd pull the plug out, and the arm would come out. It was very remote looking, you know. <laughs> So we also, we had three tanks during the time we were working. We had the Samadhi tank, then we had a float to relax tank, and then we had a floatarium. And this picture is just simply showing you how crude the EEG work we were doing was. You remember um, what was going on yesterday uh, with a discussion of yeah, so it was basically that was what we were doing with the electrodes that were connected to the person <laughs> and while they're floating. Oh, I got a better one in a minute, you'll see. <laughs> um, so everything was going along pretty well and then we started running into a couple of issues. Like one was that the tank was in a lab on the third floor, and one day, when we were changing the fluid, the hose got left running in the tank, and everybody went home. And then, the campus police contacted me and said, there's a flood on the third floor. <laughs> and so, that's the way we found out that we needed a floor drain. And as it turned out, this floor drain thing, <laughs> that flood went from the third floor down into the second floor, and below our lab was a computer center. <laughs> Even though it was ancient computers, it still didn't like magnesium sulfate. <laughs> so we had stalactites of magnesium sulfate hanging from the ceiling in this computer lab, and Tom and I were looking at each other, so what should we do? Close the door. <laughs> you know, that was a solution, right? But then we started thinking about it, and eventually we knew that they were going to go in there. So we went in, and we tried to clean it up. We tried to, but it was impossible, you know? We knocked the stalactites off the ceiling, and we were able to get uh, a lot of the salt that was all over the surface of the computers wiped off but it still looked terrible. And so the next day, I'm in front of the tank room and down the hall comes the chairman of the Department of Pharmacology, Dr. Ascari, and he's not in a good mood. He said, as he approached me, he looks at me and he goes, he's Egyptian. We cannot have this happening. So he went back and tried to get the tank thrown out of the building. But my chairman, Leonard Nelson, came to the rescue and he said, look, we can just cover the cost of getting this fixed up and we'll put a drain in the floor. So that's how we got a floor drain. <laughs> now, the next thing on this list is that we were beginning to move into a whole realm of possibilities, what we could actually do in terms of where should we start, what should we do. And we knew about the old stress style approach to uh, being in water and, and sensory deprivation actually on the left there. But we were interested in lowering stress and also in exploring the inner self, using something that looked more like what was in the upper right. And so at the beginning, we said we should start out simple. So we started out by taking blood pressure and heart rate because they, you can do those things before and after a float and it's pretty quick, it's pretty easy, it's not messy. And at the time when we were beginning this in 1980, we were, calling the, the, we were just calling this a tank, that was it. It was an isolation tank. But in 1980, Peter Sudfeld, 
in Canada and Rod Borey in New York had been discussing a name for this whole thing, that what we were going to be doing. And they decided that a restricted environmental stimulation therapy might be good. So even from the beginning, they were thinking therapy. And we were thinking therapy from the beginning. Because we were in a medical school. Repeated floating was really the key. We learned over time that it took a while for people to accommodate, the subjects to accommodate to it. And so we eventually reached the point um, even though early on we were floating people only two or three times before we would collect data uh, as a baseline, we ended up at the point where we figured a minimum of four floats to get people to the point where you could begin to study them. And honestly, retrospectively and now, I would say you'd, the more floats, the better to get people started and to the point where they're having an experience that when they get in there, it's going to happen quickly. So the basic methods we used for data collection were the common ones. We measured blood pressure and heart rate. We took blood samples for measuring hormones. We also measured hormones in saliva and urine. We did EEGs, these really crude ones. We used self-report scales and subjective comments. And we worked and tailored each one for whatever study we were doing. And the endpoints we were measuring were um, pretty straightforward also, blood pressure and heart rate. As far as the hormones went, we focused on hormones of the adrenal stress axis, which have been already discussed, so I don't know, go into those details right now. Um, cortisol and aldosterone, mostly cortisol, uh, and then epinephrine and norepinephrine and ACTH, which is the pituitary hormone that stimulates the adrenal cortex to make the cortisol. We also looked at a non-stress axis hormone, luteinizing hormone, which is in the reproductive system coming from the pituitary. And we also looked at endorphins. We looked a little bit at immune function, but it was in the crudest fashion, not like MC Flux presented yesterday. This was very crude. We were measuring salivary IgA which is a very crude measure of immune function. But it can give you some information. Um, and we also looked in the arthritis studies that we did, we looked at two other measures of immune function, which, which I can talk about briefly. But finally, interoceptive information, which is what's the individual experiencing? and their sense of well-being, but also what input is coming into them, you know, that they are aware of. So we did pain rating scales and self-reports uh, regarding self-awareness. In the clinical area, which we moved into eventually, much later as we had been doing these early studies, it took us about 10 years to get through them. Um, we looked at arthritis and uh, several measures there and the, the two ESR, which is erythrocyte sedimentation rate and CRP, which is C-reactive protein. Those are both, again, crude measures of um, immune function. And we also looked at pain that was unrelated to arthritis, headache, back and shoulder pain. And we used pain logs, rating scales there and rating scales for the relaxation response as well. So that was the core of the stuff we did. I'll show you a couple of details in a moment, but that was basically the core of the stuff we were doing. And we had a fortune of having medical students, graduate students, nursing students uh, that were at the medical school who were interested in what we were doing and that were willing to be helpers and also, in some cases, subjects. And it's funny, once you get one person that is in a group of people that is willing to become a subject for a research project, then the others start coming forward and they will, they will join. So uh, before I proceed into um, any details about the work we did with cortisol, I just wanted to mention that we have this 
neuroendocrine substrate for physiological self-regulation. And it includes the brain, the base of the brain where the hypothalamus is, and the pituitary gland that's connected to it, and which is directed by the hypothalamus, and then the limbic system, which really facilitates the communication between all of those areas and the cortex. If you look at it diagrammatically in the crudest form, the green area there is essentially the limbic areas and structures, the limbic pathways and structures. And so the, what I'm trying to make a point of is that there is communication between cortical function and the hypothalamus and the pituitary because of the hypothalamus. And so you have feedback regulation that is influenced both by the endocrine system and by mental and emotional state. And this is a two-way street. So psychological state can influence endocrine function and endocrine hormones can influence psychological state. So we took this picture and we started looking at how li linking, that there were a number of links of cognition and other cortical functions to neuroendocrine and hypothalamic controls through the limbic system. So these are examples of functions in the body that are assisted by this uh, pathway of these linkages between cortex, limbic system, um, and hypothalamus. So within this larger picture, we started looking specifically at the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And basically, as was mentioned yesterday, the simple picture is that in pink you have, if stress occurs, you have an increase in cortisol, increase aldosterone, and increase in catecholamines, epinephrine and norepinephrine, okay? And if you have a relaxation response, it goes the other way. And that was the tenet that we worked with when we did the first set of studies. And this is the graph that I think puts all of the subject of relaxation and flotation in terms of the endocrine system into perspective. So this was a study we did, um, published study, peer-reviewed journal, of plasma cortisol levels in subjects that had experienced a baseline, several sessions, then a treatment period of several sessions, and then a follow-up period without sessions. And what was really clear here, if you compare the non-rest condition, which is just reclining on a uh, recliner in a dimly lit room, uh, to the rest environment, which was floating in the tank, you can see that not only do the absolute numbers change and remain lower with the tank, but you see that those, dotted, those dots there represent the variation around the mean, and so it means that uh, this was the beginning of our awareness that there may be an effect in the regulatory process of decreasing the variation around the mean associated with flotation, with repeated flotation, and the fact that it was sustained. So another thing we looked at was comparing biofeedback as a tool for relaxation with rest. And the in all cases where we were measuring hormones, we found that rest was more effective at reducing hormone levels uh, than biofeedback. Another thing that we found that was critical for us was that repeated flotation led to a decrease in the variability of cortisol around the mean. And not only, since you're decreasing the amount of the hormone uh, that's present on average, you have to take into account that that could decrease the variability around the mean. So we calculated the coefficient of variation, the bottom line there, and it was still very significant the, uh, in the rest, but not in a non-rest condition. So that was for us a pretty powerful measurement. We, we began then looking at uh, the idea of the possibility that there was some process in, in regulation or feedback regulation of hormonal systems uh, 
at least the cortisol feedback loop that was affected by flotation. And we got pretty curious about this. I went and spent about a month at Yale University with an investigator named Gary Schwartz, who was a person who had done a lot of the original work on a subject called dysregulation, which is where feedback loops go into um, a state of disarray and that one of the goals of relaxation training is to help those feedback loops come back to normal. And as part of that time I spent with Gary Schwartz, we began to develop, uh, Tom and I began to develop a, a basic theory about this process or a hypothesis about how this could be related. So in order to, uh, before I, I go into that in a, in a little bit, I want to talk about how we got blood samples from subjects that were in the tank while they were floating. So one of the things that is, if you look at the upper diagram, we tried having the subject put their arm out and, and we had an indwelling line in the back of their hand, okay? It was just too clumsy. I mean, part of their body sticking out of the tank. It's not a really normal float, you know? And so we went to the bottom diagram, which was putting their hand on a floating pad in the tank and then putting the line in on the back of their hand. Interestingly, once they got this into this uh, and we were taking repeated floats and samples, they adapted pretty readily. I mean, they said they were having normal floats. They really got into outer space, etc. cetera. So it was, it was effective. The reason we had to do it this way is because those two hormones, epinephrine and norepinephrine in the stress system, uh, stress response system, have a very short half-life, about 90 seconds to two minutes. And so by the time you could put a person in the tank, float them, and then take them out after the float, you wouldn't be able to tell what had happened. So this was why we went that direction. Next thing was what we felt that these studies showed over the period of years that we were doing it. So we found positive effects on the physiology, in other, in other words, physiology down. Decreased blood pressure and heart rate, decreased stress-related hormones, decreased variability in cortisol regulation, and improved immunity. We also found improved sense of well-being, improved task performance, decreased pain levels in patients. That was universal decreased pain and improved function in arthritis patients and greater efficacy than other stress reduction techniques. So that's basically what we found during that time we were working. But another thing that came out of this was we felt there was something going on in this flotation thing that didn't go on in other relaxation modalities. Some kind of restructuring, refunctioning of the brain. So we began looking at a subject called systems regulation. And that was basically feedback loops and uh, we, we, we basically studied feedback loops. And the idea was that in a state of chronic stress, the feedback loops were disrupted to the extent that the individual couldn't function properly. So We also, on the basis of knowing that psychological state can influence endocrine state and endocrine state can influence psychological state, um, we use this as part of this relaxation training paradigm. And finally, based on the, the subject of psychoneuroimmunology as an example, uh, it's the study of the interaction between physiological state and immune function. MC Flux talked about it yesterday. But we looked at the fact that chronic stress facilitates cancer, asthma, and allergies, and that de-stressing could facilitate a return to normal. So we basically developed this loop. And the main thing I would mention in the loop is if you look at where it says begin with high life stress, negative attitude, and poor psychosocial support, and you insert, this is a loop that's used in, in the theory of relaxation training, you insert flotation in there. And one of the things that comes out of that is the individual, aside from improving the physiological state, 
they have an improved sense of well-being. Their attitudes get better because they're feeling better. Their self-esteem goes up. They cope better. And so they can move into a realm of maximum self-care for t- taking better care of themselves. So the last thing I want to address really is the subject of uh, consciousness and self-awareness because that's really how it, it started uh, when John Lilly developed this system. And that's me and John and Tom around 1980. What year was that, Tom? 1990. And this was a visit. I made several visits to John uh, in his house in Malibu. And that's Glenn Perry on the left, John on the right, and his wife, and uh, John's wife, Tony Lilly, in the center. And one of the things that on those visits, occasionally John and I would get into a discussion and Tony would listen to it. And in that discussion, we would come to a, a place where we would disagree. And John, in the subject of whether you need experiments to do rest work or whether you just need experience that can get you to that place. And he was talking about consciousness, essentially. We were thinking more of a clinical application. But he said, well, you don't really need, experience is much more efficient, faster to get you to the goal, etc." So Tony was in the kitchen, and she heard that, and she said, John, sometimes you have to lower, sometimes you have to lower a rope or a line from that helicopter you're in so that the average person can sort this out. And John just sat there, and he kind of had a smile, but he didn't say anything else. (laughs) So the last thing I want to address is that this subject of attention. I think attention is a very important subject, and that's a lot of what the tank is about. So Albert Einstein said, The whole of science is nothing more than a refinement of everyday thinking. Well, that's talking about attention to detail. Bob Dylan wrote, some people feel the rain, others just get wet. Another aspect of how close attention are you paying to something. Look at this image. What do you see? Well, there's somebody hanging from an opening. That's actually an island out there in the ocean and there's water on the floor of this concrete structure. But you have to actually look at it for a minute before you can pull anything useful out of it. And then a question becomes, is that person going up or down? So the subject of attention is a very important subject. So the last thing I would say about that is that during the course of the work we were doing, Tom and I came up with basically looking looking at the role of attention, uh, hypothetically, the role of attention being physiology down and the attention turned inward um, as part of this mechanism by how flotation works. And so the question was, why would attention lead lead to a tighter regulation in feedback? And our perspective was that when you have repeated regular floating, it gradually manipulates the attention from the direction of, from the space of appraisal of the situation to actual acceptance of that. And therefore, the allostatic set points will gradually move toward a more basal homeostasis with less reactivity to symbolic stressors. And this will be accompanied by a lower variation around the mean. So that's where we left that subject. We didn't do any more studies on it. So I want to move back to the future now. And to sew this up, looking at these six 
international rest conferences that were occurred between 1983 and 1997. These conferences and the, the proceedings that were published from these conferences have certainly served as, a, as some core material for the science, the theory, and the applications related to rest. So I prepared several float tune quotes. Albert Einstein, he's basically saying, if you're going to do research, pick a subject that, you know, really you can get into. Don't pick some simple thing, you know, like gravity. <laughs> <laughs> so we think that flotation is complex. So it's not the thinnest part of the board where we're drilling, but it is complex. That doesn't mean it doesn't deserve a lot of attention. Regarding the theory part, well, John Lilly said regarding consciousness, in the realm of consciousness, you can program yourself to move into any space you know exists if you use discipline and concentration. And I think that subject of discipline and concentration are important in that regard. And then finally, regarding application, Lee Perry said, and this was back in 1983, the pre and post session float center procedures are important. She said, we can present the floater with the idea that how they use the floating experience is up to them. And she basically said that th this morning. And we can help them integrate it after. So in terms of float centers and people coming in and, and floating, I think that that message is really important. You know, the, the experience that the person has before they go in there and after they come out is probably about as important as the experience they have inside. The last thing I wanted to say, uh, this, is a, this is a drawing that was done by my daughter when she was 10 years old. And one of the things I really liked about it was that it, w it, it was unfettered. It didn't have anything saying what it needed to look like. It was, a f it was a face. And that was her goal. But all of the other stuff was just came out of, her, out of her mind. And so what that means to me is that I think one of the things that floating can really provide is that kind of unfettered reality for us and... And therefore, I mean, I, I feel very strongly that the subject of consciousness and awareness of self and the getting tuned into your own self is, is so critical. And, and part of that is the process of becoming free inside there. And I think child mind has that freedom. And as we grow and become older and more mature and go through the things that life offers or doesn't, that's when we get restricted. So I think flotation offers that possibility and to, to be unfettered. Thanks very much.